Hey guys, and welcome back. Um, so this panel is going to be really exciting, even though it has the word regulation in it at first. For many people, I think the word regulation can be almost off-putting. It sounds so strict, you know, it's government, it's downbogging. But really when we talk about regulation, I think regulation is really the key to this industry because it really holds the future of cryptocurrencies and blockchain in its hands. You know, how are startups going to be regulated? How will that affect the market? How will that affect, you know, this industry at large? And I can truly say we have, you know, put together an all-star panel here with um, experiences from running exchanges to running personal identity uh, blockchains um, to, you know, attorneys um, that have experience in this exact field. So I'm really excited to get going. A little bit about myself and how my background regulation, I won one of the first, you know, cryptocurrency hedge funds. At the same time, also, I'm working with one of the first security tokens. So I've had experience of going through both of the processes, you know, being a hedge fund and setting up security token uh, gear blockchain, where essentially we're securitizing and tokenizing green energy, uh, which has been an exciting and, you know, whirlwind of a ride getting these different entities set up. So without further ado, I want to introduce and let you introduce yourselves um, and tell us what you're all about. Cool. Everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Huang. I'm the uh, managing partner of Dynamic FinTech Group here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I travel around quite a bit, uh, China, USA. Uh, also, meanwhile, I'm uh, the advisor uh, for a few uh, blockchain projects. One of the project is called the key, uh, uh, TKY symbol. Uh, it actually launched the last year. Uh, uh, and uh, have the ICO, uh, it is January uh, this year. Uh, it's mainly is, is focused on the dynamic uh, real-time multiple dimensional identity, could potentially used for meter the regulation. So, uh, in terms of regulation, it's uh, not really my expertise, but um, uh, when I advise in the project, uh, I look more from the security and the technology perspective. So that's what I'm looking at. Uh, of course, uh, for the project to be really uh, a real-world application, have to comply with the regulation, that's important. So that's also I'm interested as well. So I'm more like today is learning from the panels. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Cool. Thanks, cool. Ken. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Chris Smith. I'm the VP of Global Business Development at Civic. Uh, Civic is a blockchain-based secure identity platform. Um, we had our ICO last year around this time and raised $33 million. So very excited to be on the panel with everybody. And we had some good um, backstage talks. So looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you. My name is uh, Dan Friedberg. Uh, I'm the chair of the payments practice at Fenwick & West. Uh, we're a technology-only law firm that specializes in representing disruptive companies, and we represent some of the largest players in the world, but that's only because we started them. Uh, we incorporated Apple. We incorporated Facebook. We represent Uber. We represent Airbnb. And we believe that the next wave is the blockchain. And we're committed to it. We represent all the different types of participants. And we believe that, uh, you know, 10 years from now, uh, we'll be looking at market caps of some of these companies that uh, dwarf any market cap of any company out there now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Bion. And uh, I think I'm the lucky guy out here that uh, was a former regulator and now uh, my role is uh, CEO of OKCoin USA. Uh, OKCoin USA is our U.S. entity uh, of the OKCoin group that will serve U.S. customers. And so just want to put a two-second plug. Uh, we will open up our U.S. platform for California cus customers only July 5th. Awesome. Thanks so much for having, uh, being here with us. So, you know, in the, it all started with Bitcoin, you know, with a group of more or less misfits, you know, rebellious, having a great idea and making it happen. And then as of last year, you know, we had all kinds of characters come into this field. And many people would like to say that this really has been more or less a wild west in 2017, raising incredible amounts of money. A lot of the, that money went to scams that never even, you know, started a project. 
And what is happening now in 2018? We have seen that regulation is on the forefront. You know, a lot of the media and outlets really talk about cryptocurrency regulation. So what I would like to hear from all of you is what kind of trends do you see in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space in 2018, 2019? Right, so uh, I think in terms of uh, the whole blockchain uh, technology, it's uh, usually the idea of the blockchain, uh, the spirit of the blockchain is really far ahead than the technology itself. And the regulation is far uh, like, uh, behind of the technology. So it's, uh, you can, s can see like uh, three different cars with different speed. The spirit of the blockchain moving the fast, right, the most fast one. And then you have the technology is a little bit slower, then the regulation is much slower. So this is how it works. Uh, so beyond uh, like 2018, 19, I think uh, if the country can try to balance the speed, right, then this, that country will really uh, profit from the whole blockchain or token economy. Uh, my, one thing I always talk when I was uh, in the summit or conference, I think in the future, the biggest economy could potentially be China in the near future. The second one may be USA. The third one is really the token economy, which is beyond like a borderless. But that really depends on how regulation can catch up. I see that uh, in Asian countries, some small country like uh, Thailand, uh, even Cambodia, Philippines, they kind of more open, welcome to the token economy than the big country. Of, of course, I think the big country has more concern, so maybe is more conservative. That's maybe the correct way of dealing with it. Uh, but uh, uh, what I see is uh, in the next two years, it will present the biggest opportunity for the country who actually can embrace it and to make sure this three cars can move like in balance. Mm -hmm. Great answer, thank I, you. Yeah, um, I'm gonna echo what some of you were saying, Ken. I think, I think you know, my day is filled with meetings and phone calls globally. And I think what you're seeing is blockchain could be that equalizer um, from a ledger perspective of tracking anything. And so when you look at my calendar, I'm talking to governments in emerging markets, I'm talking to well-established governments about how they plan to use the blockchain for everything from voting to food stamps. So I think what is very interesting about blockchain is that it seems like the entire world is trying to figure this thing out. And everyone from a large telco in Africa to the government entity here in the United States is really trying to understand what use case and what proof of concept can they develop to ensure that is not only decentralized, but will work for all the citizens or for all their consumers. So what really excites me about blockchain is the application of the platform itself and how many use cases we can come up with um, around the world to really impact a lot of change from voting to uh, KYC, which we'll talk about later. Awesome. How about you, Dan? Yes, you know, those are all interesting points and uh, very interesting, Ken, the comment about the third largest economy being the token holders. And that's, uh, you know, I hadn't really quite thought of it that way, but it's, uh, you know, unlike the, uh, the blockchain, which has no barriers, you know, unfortunately, our regulatory authorities do. And we see, as is typical, our country struggling and being behind others. Uh, we haven't seen really anything come out of the regulators, which is unexpected. We have seen this slow progression of uh, being completely unclear about how Bitcoin was going to be classified to now uh, general acceptance, at least from the SEC. But it's important to remember that the SEC is just one of our regulatory agencies. And frankly, the trend that we're going to be seeing are the other regulatory agencies moving against uh, companies and issuers who are ignoring their regulations. Uh, so virtual currency in our country is regulated by, on the federal level, by a division of the Department of Treasury uh, called FinCEN. Uh, it's similar to the FBI in that it's a division of the uh, Treasury. 
And that's, a, you know, that, I think FinCEN regulation is something that we're going to see a lot more of uh, upcoming. And the consequences are significant. It's not doing a settlement with the SEC. Uh, the FinCEN comes to your office with guns and they arrest you. So we, we're going to see a trend uh, towards these other regulators actually exercise, and exercising and flexing their muscles. Uh, the other big area, sort of the third uh, uh, leg on the stool, I like to say, are the consumer compliance and the consumer protection agencies. Uh, to the extent that a token is determined to be property and not a security, it really is under the jurisdiction of these protection agencies. And similarly, uh, you know, many issuers ignore those rules as well. Uh, really, uh, all three uh, legs of the stool have to be followed. I think all of this regulation is generally positive. Uh, certainly, there's enough clarity there that there is a legal path forward uh, and for really basically whatever role you want to play. Uh, there are some issues with tokens that are securities in exactly how they're going to be traded on the secondary market that are still being worked out. But other than that area of uh, fogginess, uh, we certainly now at least have a path where issuers can com comply. Awesome. Um, I think I want to center my comments on two items uh, that I see. It's almost like two phenomenons. Uh, number one, uh, maybe I could uh, take a quick poll. How many of you uh, run a startup or are entrepreneurs uh, yourselves? Uh, as you can see by the number of hands, I think that first phenomenon is that we're seeing almost another resurgence of uh, just uh, eager, innovative, smart entrepreneurs out there. And I see that, I don't know who the winners are, uh, but we just see another wave of uh, just another uh, enthusiasm, hardworking, uh, just a, a community of crypto out there. And so I think that's gonna pay dividends uh, with hopefully better use cases, uh, better products, better services. And uh, I think uh, I'm just uh, lucky to uh, witness that and to see what's gonna come, up, come about. The second thing I wanna highlight is uh, because this topic uh, is centered on regulations, I think we're also seeing innovation by regulators, believe it or not. Uh, OKEX, our sister company, has committed to expand into Malta. And it's because uh, we had the opportunity to not only read and study what Malta is trying to do, but we actually visited Malta, met with the legislature, uh, the regulators, and the FIU, which is FinCEN's equivalent. And uh, we thought that, you know, this country, Malta, had a really uh, fertile, cultivating landscape uh, for the crypto community. And I think uh, you've seen glimpses of that in Switzerland. Uh, you've seen it um, uh, in Gibraltar. Uh, it kind of came up in Isle of Man a couple years ago. And so I think you're gonna see more and more countries that are gonna be more progressive in helping out entrepreneurs to get that regulatory certainty out there. Wow, that was a vast array of different answers and a lot of the agreement as well, so I love that. Now I'm gonna take a time, some time and ask a direct question to some of you based on your backgrounds. Uh, and I actually wanna start with you, Tim. Um, since you, know, you run an exchange, um, one other trend that has been really emerging uh, from a regulatory standpoint is um, you know, the rise of security coins and security tokens. How does that look like for both a consumer you know, who goes in the exchange, because I understand that a you know, security token would underlie different, you know, regulations from a trading perspective than a normal utility token. Absolutely. Uh, so the SEC has made it clear uh, that, uh, you know, the most popular phrase is they have not seen an ICO that is not a security. <laughs> uh, that, that was a verbal narrative. I think it was a message uh, to send out to the community to really uh, uh, look at what you're doing and to comply with existing security laws. Uh, we are 
regulated by FinCEN as a convertible virtual currency, a term that FinCEN has defined back in March 2013, believe it or not. So, you know, more than five years ago, uh, the U.S. had a regulator that studied Bitcoin and came out with these written rules. I think it's very applicable. Everyone should still read it because I think it resonates even today. The security side is a field that we cannot play with uh, because we don't have that authority unless we are regulated by the SEC as a broker-dealer uh, with an ATS license in order to facilitate a trading platform. ATS is short for Alternative Trading System. Uh, it's kind of like the national trading system uh, that we all know in the New York Stock Exchange uh, and NASDAQ. Uh, but basically, we currently do not have the authority to play in that field. So we do not trade or facilitate trading of securities. Uh, but you probably read the news on the media. Uh, companies like us are looking into ways to possibly buy or build or start a broker-dealer ATS. And that's how we could get into the securities arena. I personally think that we will continue to see more security tokens uh, in the U.S., uh, probably globally. And so uh, it's something that we really need to keep our eyes on. I, I believe both are going to grow, including the non-security uh, tokens or utility tokens or what they call crypto, core crypto, uh, such as Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin. Great answer. And actually, I can segue with that right into question I have for Dan. Now, given, as you just said, you, know, we, you have to choose between whether you're going to go the utility token route or the security token route, which of course is a lot more paperwork and also costs a lot more money for you know, a startup which could you know, really um, throttle innovation. How would you recommend or how can the team decide whether the right way to go is the utility token route or the security token route? Yeah, no, and that's an interesting question and it's a common one. And uh, you know, unfortunately, it's really not up to the entrepreneur in that uh, it's a uh, really we have to look at the regulatory definitions. And these aren't definitions that really have been clear. Uh, what I like to think about when I think about a uh, quote security token is that's a token that will always be a security uh, in the US. And that contrasts, uh, and I'm sure everyone saw the recent comments by Hinman, which is mandatory listening if you haven't, uh, and that contrasts with this type of token that he talked about that may initially start as a security and then become a utility token. So, the, And this is a fluid uh, analysis. So normally, uh, at least in my world, it, it, I like to think of a security token as a token that will always be a security. And that type of token ultimately will have to be traded through broker-dealers uh, or on an ATS-type framework. Uh, and uh, that's due to our regime. So unfortunately, with those security tokens, we're out of Satoshi's dream, and there will always be an intermediary. But uh, with respect to the other types of tokens, uh, th those that are utility tokens, th that does not need, that can be traded through another type of licensure, which OKCoin is, you know, one of the best actors and is obtaining all those necessary licenses. Uh, we actually see a, there's a big gray dark market of exchanges that don't comply, and it's but it's a pleasure now that uh, the industry is growing up and we have uh, uh, compliant players like uh, OKCoin. Uh, but uh, but that type of uh, the regime that OKCoin is using it doesn't really fit with securities. Uh, I do want to note one other thing which is important, is the definition of security. Uh, there are really two sec acts to be concerned about in the U.S. One is the Securities Act, and that governs the sale of securities. And the second is the Exchange Act, which governs the secondary markets and the distributions of equity securities. If you have more than equity, uh, 2,000 holders of equity securities, you actually have to register as a public company. So one thing to note for people who are pursuing the 
uh, security token t path, which isn't talked about much, is there's a secondary analysis of whether you're an equity security. Because if you are, most likely you're going to have to register as a public company. Great. Now, this actually segues also perfectly into the next question I have. Because you know, a few years ago, you know, I was running normal startups, and back then you could even get away with you know not filing for an LLC for a couple of years, uh, not years, a couple of months. Um, <laughs> but nowadays, you know, as a as a fund or even like launching tokens, you can't really go a day without you know going through some KYC AML paperwork. It's uh, basically become like the norm now that you know you don't just do it once; you probably do it dozens of times with different partners you set up. You know, whether with a fund, for example, different institutional <coughs> accounts. Now, Chris, you work with Civic, and what I really see uh, the KYC a AML process as a kind of a bottleneck towards that innovation because sometimes it can take weeks uh, for some decisions to be made that could, you know, in old school, where, you know, before all that, it was so institutionalized, more or less, could happen, uh, you know, in a heartbeat. What are you seeing happening in this year, perhaps even Civic is doing to streamline, streamline that KYC process? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think, I think the interesting thing about Civic is we're kind of in the middle between uh, blockchain security and identity. Mm -hmm. And those things are all overlapping now with what you just described. So when you look at your traditional uh, KYC process, if you're applying for a home loan, you may have to fill out the same form three or four different times at Wells Fargo or Citi or HSBC. So from a consumer perspective, um, it becomes tedious and mm -hmm. takes a long time. So one of the things that we're really focused on at Civic is this idea of reusability, right? So as you're adding attributes to your Civic ID, um, if you're asked to scan a passport, once you've been validated um, that that passport is real or that driver's license real and that is you, that gets added to your Civic ID. Mm -hmm. So as you continue to add new um, attributes to your Civic ID, you get to reuse that and it makes it very easy for the consumer, which ultimately reduces the latency and speeding things up. I don't know if anyone was at Consensus in New York. A couple, okay. <laughs> um, other than Ken. Um, you know, we did a really uh, great, we have a really great partnership with Anheuser-Busch. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some people in the, in the room saw this, but uh, we launched the first crypto vending machine for beer. And you had to download the Civic app to create your Civic ID, which validates you um, with a liveness test, some biometrics. But then when you went to the next step, that's what Anheuser-Busch wanted to validate that you were 21 or over. So that you had to scan your passport, your driver's license, or your national identity card. And once you got validated through the Civic Marketplace, you would just walk up to the vending machine and it had zero knowledge proof of who you were, but it knew that you were 21 or over and you were able to get a, a beer. So like simple use cases like that are very cool in the, in, in the, you know, in the media space from a, a press perspective. But it's actually a great use case to see how the blockchain can change so many different things, not only from um, a KYC perspective, but just specific services that we need to, to get after. And one final point on it, it's you know, if you look at the marketplace, you know, Reuters estimates that most big financial institutions are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on KYC every yeah. year. And so one of the things that we're really focused on is that we believe usability is going to help everyone in the global marketplace mm -hmm. to reduce some of their overall KYC costs and their needs because as users continue to adopt the Civic platform, the reusability of that will actually make um, uh, the, the companies that are doing the validation um, go a lot, the process go a lot faster. Of course, so, go a lot yeah. faster. And yeah. I think, as you told me backstage, like a number like $500 million, which you said it's not even global. Yeah. Um, so it's an incredible inefficiency, which is, you know, one of the main things that, you know, blockchain is meant to solve. You know, remove inefficiencies, remove the middlemen, and just speed up the whole process. Uh, and the last can with you, uh, you've advised and also invested in numerous startups and projects based out of Asia. And as we all know, Asia has had some of the strictest, you know, regulation breakdowns down, whether it was in China or South Korea or even India, you know, sometimes banning all of ICOs or banning all trading or banning crypto all in general. What would be some lessons that we could learn from the startups that you've worked with who thrived even though they lived in such uh, a strict regulatory environment? Right. So I think uh, for any blockchain project, it's very important is, uh, to uh, be uh, meet the regulation to be legal, right? So it's uh, one way of dealing with it is uh, like uh, um, most of you know, uh, the, although the operational team could potentially be in China, but they have the company uh, in Singapore, mm -hmm. right? As a, as a legal entity in Singapore. 
and they are not doing the ICO. It's more like funded by the investment organization, not by private citizen. So those invest company, investment company, could be also registered in the foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So one way dealing with it to be legal is this kind of scheme. Uh, another thing is really doing the strict uh, uh, KYC, right? If you really want to do ICO, basically you have to say uh, the U.S. citizen, Chinese citizen, Singapore citizen, they are excluded, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you have to do the uh, KYC to make sure they actually excluded, right? So it's, uh, that takes time. Uh, but uh, I think the one of the projects uh, I have been working on is the TKY, is a key project. It's uh, similar to, uh, we learn a lot from Civic, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's why we're also in the same panel with Vinny, <laughs> the Chris's co-worker, co 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 uh, in consensus. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of things we can learn from each other. The, the way TKY is working is really we think the identity is not just one perspective. Mm -hmm. Like we have multiple dimensions. When you do the shopping, you need uh, maybe just email the address. But if you really need to do the KYC, you have to know more. Right? Or if you need to go to airplane, you need to do uh, something else. Or go to the medical insurance, you need uh, more uh, the other set of identity. So this is uh, what is the key behind the thing. It has a uh, kind of patent. Uh, uh, technology, as well as uh, the, they have data, the social insurance data from uh, the national database. So that's the approach we're wow. taking. It's hard, it's, uh, yeah. it's not easy. Uh, maybe it's really hard to do in USA. It's maybe a little bit easier in China than here. Oh. So that's why I make uh, TKY's approach slightly different from Civic. But uh, the, the ideas uh, we learn a lot from Civic, right? So it's a self conscious self sovereign identity. Mm -hmm. User have to control the identity. So that's important. Privacy is important. So you cannot really put your identity on the chain, right? You mm -hmm. have to put it uh, so decentralized. The user control it. Mm -hmm. So that's the but, idea. But that's very interesting because, you know, back in 2017, it was more like, it was such an easy thing. You know, teams could just like upload, you know, the basic code that even Ethereum website had like as a copy and paste. Yeah. Uh, and you could have your ICO, but what you're saying now is, you know, it's, it's a lot harder. And especially not only do you have to do a lot more work, but you even have to make those tough decisions like saying, you know what, we can't take any money from the US market or from, mm -hmm. the, from the Chinese market. And you're cutting out, out a lot of capital. Right, so um, it's not as easy as it used to be, that, but I think it's a great time for the industry because it can filter out a lot of the wrong crowd because those that will actually go through doing this hard work have a lot more of the right intentions than a lot of the crowd that we attracted uh, in the last year. Now, if, because you know, we're kind of short on time, I wanna go get to this question, I was really excited for this. If you had the chance that perhaps you know, the legislatures of maybe the US, China, whatever country you prefer, were to invite you um, to you know, work with them on really working out the regulation, what would be your ideal, what would be some of the ideal changes you would want to see implemented that you think would not only like, allow innovation to thrive while at the same time you know, ensuring uh, you know, consumer safety? Yes, that's a really good question. I, I think the, in terms of ICO, it's an innovative idea of the raising the fund. Uh, before I came here, I had a summit also in Beijing. There's one, uh, the former chief economist from World Bank said uh, the uh, real GDP growth of a country is uh, closely tight, uh, associated on the approach to dealing with the finance. So if you have more efficient finance, your GDP growth will be, be better. So that's just, kind of empirical studies they have done. Uh, so once I see this, I, uh, I actually put some comments on my WeChat uh, movements, right? Said maybe a regulated ICO will be a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. And I, I always think of this way, right? So uh, China ban on the ICO, uh, maybe it's a temporary measurement mm -hmm. because of lots of shit coin things happen, right? So it's maybe good, uh, a, a temporary, but in the long term, I think uh, eventually it will need a regulated ICO. It's, it's uh, different because the whole blockchain 
decentralized the whole technology, the whole spirit behind the uh, blockchain or the business model will need new regulation. The old regulation in China or in USA, SEC or FinCEN or even IIS, right, has to be adapted. So the old idea of the security being a security has to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way is really you can allow the ICO, but you have to register. And you have put the bonds for, you, for the ICO, mm -hmm. right? You, you basically kind of, you have to meet certain milestones, and then you can release some funds. And also that allows the regulator to recruit some people. Maybe they have to spend some money first before they can do ICO, mm -hmm. right? And that money can be used by the regulator to hire some good people to review the material mm -hmm. or to do the due diligence, to check the team, to see if they're really doing the work or not, right? So, so but then let me push back on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Is that something that a regulator should, regulator should do or that simply the community, you know, like, selects as a standard where we say, for example, you know, we're going to back the projects that have strict milestones, that have, you know, smart contracts in place to do that? Yeah, I think it's both ways. I think before actually ban on September 4th on the ICO. In China, there's all, already have a organization like uh, between the ICO companies, right? They are self-regulating and trying to, um, maybe not in the smart contract, not like what uh, Vitalik proposed. I think mm -hmm. the way Vitalik proposed is, is a good way, but we have to see how it goes, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, they already have an organization say that we should not have a shit coin, we should really do the real thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but eventually I think you, you need to merge, like uh, the regulator has to really be innovative to Tim's points, right? To have to be innovative, you have a regulation technology coming. And eventually I think blockchain could really improve the regulation. Mm -hmm. you, if you really have this, uh, maybe really controversial, but I think the regulator, the reg there will be a node in the blockchain. The regulator node is a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's more like a from consortium chain perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a, maybe the public chain, you don't need the regulator, maybe it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just public. But uh, in the real world application, you will need the uh, a, a consortium chain. Okay. That's, that, that's the, the whole, like the third economy. It's uh, from my view, is a consortium chain between consortium chain and a consortium mm -hmm. chain to the public chain. That's the future, like uh, how token economy works. Then the regulator has to be part of the node mm -hmm. in the consortium chain. And, and with the proper, like a uh, judge note, like a judge or with it, right? right? They can check a certain transactions. Hmm. That's controversial, but that's yeah, kind of my, my thinking. <laughs> I, I could debate with you a long yeah, time yeah, for that. I, I know, would, yeah. <laughs> would it be the government in charge? Mm. Or would it be, like you said, a consortium blockchain or yes. self-regulation? But what right. are your thoughts on that, Chris? Uh, I mean, I think the first thing for all the entrepreneurs out there is you need to have a good attorney <laughs> to, help, <laughs> uh, to help you kind of navigate through a lot what, what Ken was saying. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 think, I think from a regulatory perspective, um, I'm not an attorney, so I can't really speak as intelligently as these two guys um, on it with their backgrounds. But I, I, think, I think, you know, when, when you're looking at your startup or you're looking at um, areas where you can succeed, you always want to look at where, you know, the regulations might be really beneficial to your business and mm -hmm. to you personally, right? So if you have a good attorney and if some place like Malta might be a great place to live for a few years to get your business off the ground, you need to think about that, right? Um, as every entrepreneur knows, like those are things that you have to be willing to, to risk and you need to ensure that you're following the regulatory guidelines. Fenwick was a major part, I wasn't there at the time, but um, Fenwick was a major part of how Civic did our ICO and making sure that we were educating the market on what we did, how we did it, um, what the uh, opportunities look like. So I think it's really important to be very buttoned up because as we were talking about earlier, there will be more regulations. We don't necessarily know what they will be. So uh, make sure uh, to get Dan's business card on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'll give it straight to Dan, I guess. Dan, I mean, if you could have, what would be your ideal regulation or in regulatory environment? Yes, and we're, 
unfortunately, we're far from the ideal. Uh, I do uh, think that uh, on the KYC AML side, that's something that will always persist. And uh, a solution that you know Civic is doing is a game changer. And that's actually, it's the real type of application that Satoshi envisioned when he wrote the white paper. And you can look at that in the white paper. When the, when the blockchain was built, he specifically allowed additional lines of code or lines of text to be created on the chain. So to, to allow information to be shared, he envisioned this use of the chain. And, that's a, and, the, and we see with Civic, a, there's a real world problem and they're harnessing the blockchain to find the solution. So that's the perfect type of blockchain company. Uh, as far as the regulatory environment, uh, we have a long way to go to achieve Satoshi's vision, and I don't think we ever will completely. But uh, on the security side of things, somehow the rules have to be changed to allow the average citizen to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, with, the, with nearly all the offerings that we do, we're pushed into what we call Reg D, which limits sales to accredited investors. And it's really a horrible thing. Uh, yeah. Basically what it does is it makes sure that the rich are the only ones that can participate in early financings. So you look at Facebook, only accredited investors could buy in. Uh, Amazon, same way, but Microsoft, same way. Uh, and now we're seeing this contaminated to the token space. And it's not right. There's no reason that uh, a regular person can't put $100 into a token. And uh, if you put $100 into Bitcoin when I started, uh, I think you'd be worth $600 million right now. So uh, uh, somehow uh, the the securities have to pass a common sense rule which isn't so biased towards the rich. Uh, and I think we're a long way off, but it's something that I'm working towards. Awesome. Excellent Cheers. comment, Dan. Um, OKCoin okay is a financial intermediary. Uh, we must do KYC. Uh, we realize there is a huge backlog in that process. Um, we, we do not utilize uh, uh, a great service like Civic. Uh, I think we actually tackle it as best as we can uh, by ramping up on our human resources, which are, is costly. Uh, you mentioned that the industry spends about $500 million on KYC. I think that's just a penny of it or an ounce of it if you look at all the controls that are underneath it. Uh, to prepare for our launch for USA, we've, uh, we have over 50 KYC verification people, uh, mm -hmm. and they're going to run a 24-7. Uh, so it's just a costly endeavor. Uh, but that's where we are. That's what's required to run a business. I think ideally, uh, and I hope it can change, but I think what uh, Dan was mentioning is we need some type of de minimis uh, limit. If you want to buy $200 of Bitcoins, uh, there should be some type of concession. And I think in Europe, uh, the KYC limit was 1,000 euros. It might be 300 euros, but we need something like that in the US. In the US, if you want to buy 0.1 Bitcoin from OKCoin, we must fully KYC you. We can't just let you buy it. That's just the rules. So uh, I think that's uh, the de minimis uh, limit is something hopefully our regulators can think about. Uh, but it's even worse than that because uh, in the US, we have many regulators. I come from the banking side. And just for banks, we have the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC. We had the OTS. We have the NCUA. We have the Federal Reserve from a bank holding company level. Uh, and now we're talking about the crypto side of not only FinCEN and the state, 50 state regulators, but if you want to go into the security token, now you have the SEC. If you want to go into uh, futures 
uh, you have the CFTC. Uh, if you want to be an introducing broker, you got the National Futures uh, Association. So it's just, that's unfortunately how we are made. Uh, in Korea, you have one, FSA. Uh, in Japan, you also have the FSA. I think that's where maybe countries can be a little more innovative and hopefully have one regulator for the crypto industry. And I think, uh, again, uh, Malta and Gibraltar and maybe the Swiss is being more accommodative to that. If you're in the crypto world, uh, they will, uh, you can hopefully just talk to one constituent <laughs> regulator and comply with their local laws. Yeah, and I hope now that we have a space force, we will be able to also have a cryptocurrency focused agency. Uh, guys, it's been a pleasure. We're actually over time already, and there's such a wealth of knowledge. In fact, I had so many more questions I wanted to ask. So, ask. so perhaps some of the, you guys will be around. If anybody wants to ask questions, I certainly will. So happy to you know, talk to any of you because um, certainly you can learn so much from all of them. So thanks so much again for joining us today. Um, you guys were all amazing.